Welcome to Graham Kerr's Kitchen. It's really two programmes in one. This is a series that appeals to your creative side. Food that is sumptuous stuff. How could that be? Uh, this is a programme about people who want to eat healthy and reduce calories. Actually, it's about food with an aromatic quality that fills the nose. Oh, sure. But it's also about keeping my arteries clean by reducing fat. But it doesn't mean a thing if the food isn't rich and colourful. Maximise the flavour. OK, but I must have healthy food that I can cook in minutes. I must minimise the risk. So welcome to Graham Kerr's Kitchen, where we get our heads together just for you. Thanks so much for being here once again. Um, this is a program where we're going to look at meat as a pioneer portion or something that's modern. And let me try and explain that to you. Come over here for a moment, because really it's something which is... Swiss. Um, are you like this? Do you look at things and say, I like the size of that? You know, for example, if you're buying a car or something like that, do you like cars with, which, which are huge or small? Because we're downsizing nowadays. What if we downsized as far as food was concerned? You know, in the early days, pioneers came here, and unquestionably, because there was a lot of meat around and because there was a lot of hard labor happening, uh, a kind of stew would have easily that amount of pieces, chunks of meat in it. Um, and say, well, some of the older recipes, mine included, by the way, um, suggested that two pounds of meat would go for four people. So you get eight ounces of raw meat would go to be able to make one. OK. Well, now, what if we were to actually take one piece of meat and make it into a larger piece and then make a stew of it, say? It's all in the visual. It's all in the eyes, really. And... Um, if just serve that up in a sauce. Well, I don't think it would go very far at all. Well, there's a certain amount of vegetables used to go in the old stew, but in this case, a great deal more vegetables and, you know, both oranges and greens, all kinds of colours, would go to support that. So, in fact, the meat would no longer be the star of the issue. It would just be part of the cast. Now, in this particular case, you would go down to only two ounces per head. So if you were to actually drop the total meat content down to two ounces, do you know what would happen? It would be wonderful in terms of the reduction of risk because of fats and things like that. But it could also save you for a family of four up to $1,000 a year. <laughs> Want to see how that works? Come along, I'll show you. <laughs> So much of what we're going to do today is going to be visualization. You know, we're going to see different things of different sizes. So let's, let's dive in, first of all, and look at these two here. Now, these are both brown stews. They've been made by radically different methods. Here is the standard kind of stew thing. You notice what's happening here. We've got a good, rich stew with lots and lots of meat in it. Looks wonderful, it's been made with a roux on the base, which is really the butter and the flour mixed together. And, and what fat there is in that sauce, that is glistening. What you see is glistens, that's fat. I mean, it's just terrific stuff, wonderful. And there's small pieces of meat just nestle in it like so. Now, if I can dig out a piece here, what I've got here in the same spoon is really, and let's bring that spoon over to that one so we can see it closer. I've got slightly more brilliant look to it because then um, there isn't so much of the, you know, the fat in it. And um, I've got a lot more vegetables and I've got a larger piece of meat than I've got in the others. Do you see? Okay. Well, let's, let's see how this all works. Um, let me show you the two pieces of meat and, and the decision that I would make if I were you see, if I was going to pull back on this one. Here is a piece of meat which would be, you know, this is called chuck steak. And I think that this would be the typical kind of meat that would be recommended for a stew because it has lots of uh, connective uh, sinews in it and it's well marbled, it's got good fat running through it, you see, and that's what you'd look for before. And that would be a two-pound piece of this for four people is what recipes said. My recipes have said that prior to 1970. But 
I'm going to suggest to you that you go to a different cut of meat, which is this one here, and this is bottom round. Now, top round has a little less fat in it and eye of round, but this one I prefer. It's got a little bit of fat in there, just enough to make it moist. And so this is the quantity I would use, eight ounces for four people, instead of that huge visual size. Well, what do you do with that? You know, I mean, surely it's going to look mean, but it doesn't have to look mean because look at these two. Here is a portion um, made with the meat. You see the amount of meat that you've got here, eight ounces, and the vegetables in support of it. But when you go to this one, which has only got that one piece of meat in it, that two ounces piece of meat, now what you have to do is you've got here uh, so much more vegetable that goes with it. And there's another factor as well. And that is, you remember I said at the beginning that we got a roux in the thing, that we actually made the sauce from a roux? Well, this is a roux. It is fat, butter normally, and flour, almost in equal quantities. And it, if you add up the sum of the total and then multiply by six, that's the amount of liquid that it can actually contain and hold. And it's wonderful. I mean, to get it, it has a gorgeous flavor. But in this stew, all the fat is held in suspension. It's just held up in there. Gorgeous, but very fatty and very rich. In this one here, I don't have that at all because it's thin. That liquid is thin, and I have to thicken it somehow. So let's look at, let's look at the way that you would finish off um, a sauce and stew like this one. This one's ready to go. Um, I'm going to um, sprinkle some peas in there, about half a, a cup of peas, and they look great. They, you know, it immediately lifts that to, instead of it just being sort of bland. And this one, I'm going to add the same thing, but just before I do, you see this, you see that I've got here? Two eggs. Now, and j just for effect, this needs to be seen. There's two cups of peas there and two eggs, and we talk a lot about protein. These are six grams of protein each. Each one of those eggs is six grams. And a cup of peas is seven grams of protein. And I'm, that's true. So when you take these two cups of, of thawed peas, which I would add at the last moment, and just stir those in, you're in fact adding as much protein as breaking two eggs into the thing. Great. Good. Then um, some mushrooms. Now this is key when you're doing a stew of this nature. Have a look at this. If you take a mushroom and you cut it like this, which is the standard way that I cut a mushroom, so that you've got a, to a good texture and appearance to it. Now, um, drop those in literally almost before you're ready to serve. Um, I've got about a, a dozen mushrooms there. And now you just simply turn the peas and the mushrooms. Look at it. Look at the textural. Look at how it looks visually. Somehow now you've got so many things going on that you don't quite notice the fact that you've got less meat than you might be accustomed to. The two ounces is a small portion. Okay, so we're bringing the heat up underneath there, and this is the last bit. Instead of that glossiness that we got in, the, in this stew here, which is very glossy and comes from fat, we're not going to get that with this technique. I'm going to pour four um, tablespoons full um, of dealkalized red wine. I, no, I like that in the stew. If you don't want to use that, that's fine. Just use beef stock, and that would be just great. And I, I prefer that to water. Um, and then mix this up with arrowroot. There's two tablespoons full of arrowroot for an average size dish of this nature. See how it's just beginning to bubble up there? Push it off the stove, hot enough, and just pour that in. Always take it off the stove before you pour it in and then pull it back because it can hit the bottom of the pan and clench up quickly, you know, the starch in it, and it makes little dumplings, and that's not such a good idea. Now, you see, as you turn this, something is going to start to happen right before your eyes. It's going to start glossing. Do you see how that is beginning to gloss up now? That starch instantly thickens, and believe it or not, but, um, well, I, I'm sure that you would. <laughs> Believe it or not, this is a strange statement to make. Um, the, what happens to this is that the mushrooms are glazing and cooking at the same time as the peas are heating through, and you're ready to serve it. Now, that really works. What I'm going to do is just to uh, show this in a... Have you ever been to one of those kind of bistro places, uh, you know, restaurant thing? Um, and you have a really nice-looking sort of stew, 
and they serve it in, in, in one of these sort of dishes. Have you ever ha had that? I think it's a great way to serve something, but you need to put it um, on a serviette underneath so it doesn't rattle all over the spot. And if you do that, it's very difficult to clean the plate. So put the, always put that down, pick up a, a, a plate to sort of save yourself, and then get hold of, of your portion. And does, this, this is a good idea, actually, for ordinary plates and ordinary things. Look at how that looks. I've got room for just a little bit more. And the mushrooms, you can say to me, Graham, they're not really cooked. And I'm saying, ha, ah, you see, have you ever had raw mushrooms, OK, raw mushrooms um, in a salad? Well, OK. These are heated right through, and they've got this terrific, marvelous texture to them. Have a look at this. Stew is one thing, and I see you can see it, it looks great. Now, here. Um, here is the problem when you apply it to a steak. Uh, this steak is, um, is a steak called a London broil, or flank steak. So just uh, spread it on there and get the garlic on the top and just sort of spread it on there, and I'm going to massage that in in just a moment. On this plate, just a little touch of oil, just, just a little bit. And then some freshly ground salt uh, over the top, just not too much, and, and freshly ground pepper. It's actually seasoning the plate. And then, after you've massaged in the garlic onto just really one side, then, and then pull it to one side, you can't have pieces of garlic on the outside of the steak. If you do, they'll burn, and it won't look good at all. So then just simply drop it down and, and uh, run it around the plate. Right? And what you've got is you, gradually, as you, as you turn it backwards and forwards, you are completely seasoning that piece of meat ready to go. There's a little bit of garlic there, won't hurt. OK, then drop it down into the pan, which is on the heat there. That's on just medium. I don't believe any longer in my life of cooking things flat, flat out, full bore. Just medium to medium low, gentle cooking, wonderful texture. Doesn't tighten all the sinews up. This is a tenderloin. Now, here's the other piece. And I'm doing this so that I can give you the visual of a flat piece of food on a plate and the visual of a high piece that stands up on the plate for steak. Because they're different problems. Right? Um, this is the tenderloin, which is kind of the king of all steaks and has little bits of trim that need to come off it. But I want to cut a piece which is about eight ounces, and hopefully that's about eight ounces. I've got a, a little uh, scales here, and I just can never see whether it's on or not. Ah, it's on. All right, what have we got there? Seven. Ha! Huh. Well, nearly eight. That's the Scottish in me coming out. All right, just um, wipe that um, in the same seasoning as before, and... Um, just, uh, you don't need to put oil in the pan, and just drop that down in the pan. I want to cook that up before, um, just as we go and have a look at the numbers. All right, put that over there. Get that out of the way. Everything cooking nicely? Great. Let's go and have a look at this and compare these numbers, all right, with the way that it would be if I had the whole of that, you know, the one that I've been showing you before. Now, looks good. I think just a dab of... Uh, of parsley on the top, it looked great. And what I was trying to do here is to make it look reasonable with all the added vegetables and yet only be a two ounce portion um, instead of all these pieces and being eight ounces. So I hope I've done that. Let's have a look and see what it looks like in terms of numbers. Now, because you've got a lot of vegetables in here and, and potatoes are part of it, I've got 576 in terms of calories, which is, a, you know, the whole meal, everything in one pot. Fat was 22.7 in the classic. This is right down to four, which is very good. And so saturated fat is only one gram of that four is saturated. Th this pleases me. Now, this really pleases me. Th this stew, which shows you that a good, well-made stew can still just about fit the American Heart Association guideline, which is 30% of calories and fat. Now, look at this. 6%, truly. Wonderful. I mean, this thrills me. Um, cholesterol, 118, is dropped down to 47. Sodium is 497, which is perfectly okay. 
and dietary fibre is a whopping 17. And that shows you what you do when you make the exchange between the high price of meat and the lower price of vegetables. You're actually going to get a tender piece of meat, you see, because the larger the piece, you have to attack it with a knife and fork. You can add other ingredients to it, you see. Um, oh, oh, that's so good. Um, yeah, I don't think it's mean at all. Let me just taste up the mushroom. Mm. 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 Such texture. When you get that, you've got the chewiness of the meat, and then you've got this texture of the mushroom, which just adds to the whole feeling of the textural side of it. Okay? Okay. Well, there's the concept done for a stew. Now, we're going to go back and look at, at how steaks work, because steaks are not as easy to do as this is. <laughs> you ready for it? Okay, come on, let's have a go. Okay, well, I'm, everything seems to be doing fine here. <laughs> let's have a go at it. Steaks are a little bit uh, more difficult, because when you start to get down to it, and you look at a tenderloin steak, um, you remember the, the one that was cut that thick, you know, that I put in here now? And uh, that seven ounce, that's about 460 calories, all right? And the one I'm going to cut here is 117. <laughs> now, oh, I can hear you say, come on, you're joking. Um, but I'm not, that's about two ounces. Um, if you're going right down to two ounces, you could go up a little bit, in, you know, to about three and a half, four ounces, but I wanted to show you in two ounce pieces. What I do is just pound that down a little bit so that, in fact, something like this little ramekin dish would be almost exactly the right size for that. And, there, and there's a reason for that. Um, okay, uh, down into the same seasoning before, just slosh it into the pan, drop it down by its, its little mate, which is doing fine now. And um, just, just um, seal it on the one side and just uh, flip it on the other side. That's right, and it won't take a moment or two before that's going nicely. All right, here's the London broil, which is sizzling away nicely there, and the pan's got all the juices down. What I would do with a tenderloin is this. I'd take um, a whole onion that size and a clove of garlic, and I'd fry that in a little, chop it fine and fry it in a little oil. And then throw in half a cup of mixed rice and a quarter of a cup of barley and a quarter of a cup of wild rice. A little salt and pepper and some fresh herbs on the top. Just some thyme and parsley and a couple of bay leaves. Huh? And then put that into a casserole dish at about 375 degrees Fahrenheit, 190 degrees centigrade. And leave it there about 45 minutes. And when you bring it out, you'll just be able to get hold of the herbs and just dispose of those. They will actually have gone down and into the dish perfectly. And then get this little ramekin dish, the one that we used as the measure, and get up the pilaf. Now, now, grease it just gently, first of all. Gently. How do you grease a thing gently? I mean, just a little, bit, a little bit of oil in the bottom. And press it down really tight. Get enough in. Don't make it brim full, but press it down tight. If you do these for one per for each person that you're doing, you know, it's half a dozen of these little ramekin conditions. They're very useful for custards and other things. So you can put those in a baking dish, stick them on a rack, and um, and put them in the oven, and then you've got it all ready, you know, for a dinner party when you're ready to serve. You just grab a hold of it like this, turn the steak over another time. Oh, looks nice. And then just drop that. Of course, it'll be hot at the time, but you could put a cloth over it and then just give it a little sharp tap. That's the reason for the little bit of gap that we left behind. There you are, see? And it comes off, looks wonderful, and that is used as a sort of lift up of something which is very thin, you see? Now, very thin, you can drape that on the top, and then take fresh vegetables there, you know, lovely pieces of broccoli, and a good hunk of, of um, <laughs> Those have got, they're bright orange, they've got to be carrots. All right, and that's the start. It's almost ready to serve. All right, let's put that on one side. Now, here is the steak before. You see how that steak looks like that now? The whole idea is to bring it up and to give it that sort of the height a little bit. 
and then vegetables on that one as well. I wanted to, 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 you know, not just compare it dully, but to give it a chance to be able to live side by side. Okay, how's that? Um, good. Now, and just a little bit of the rice pilaf, just, get, uh, just to make sure that everybody's sort of doing right. How's that? Good. All right. Now, that's that dish, but it isn't, doesn't stop there because you've got to move from that into the flat area. That's the upstanding one. Now, what about the flat one? Well, this is the flat. This is the London broil, and um, this is a great steak, by the way, to be able to use from this point. It's got low fat in it. Drain any surplus fat that there is in the pan from the pan, dust it out with paper, you know how I do it, and then take a, you know, a certain amount, what's it, one, two, three, four, about four cups of, um, of this dealkalized wine here, and then stir it off the bottom so as to get the residue of those meat residues off the bottom and into the wine. Just get that heated up for a moment. And then just a little arrowroot. Now this is where you're going for the little tiny sauce at the end. About two tablespoons full of the wine. Might as well keep the wine going. If you don't want to use wine, just the same as before, you can use stock instead. And when you've got it like this, you just simply withdraw it from the pan, always withdraw it from the pan, and throw it, and be, um, move it around quickly, very quickly, so that it doesn't form those lousy little dumplings, <laughs> which can ruin the whole thing. Shake the pan, a little bit of, of parsley on the top. Gosh, that looks nice. All right, so there's your sauce. It's all ready to be able to anoint the whole thing. Okay, let's have a look at and see how you carve this. You simply take <coughs> um, diagonal slices uh, through with a London broil. You carve it diagonally. You see how that looks? And you just carve that through there, nice and, nice and pink, perfectly done. And there is a very thin, flat slice on the plate. Now, see how this looks against this. See how it covers about the same amount of plate size, about the hand. Well then, all you need to do is to take a little of this sauce and just pour that sauce over the... Don't cover the whole thing. Let me show you what this looks like now. If you finish this dish off by putting a little of the sauce, that deglazing, over the top. Now, doesn't that look great? Uh, uh, all right, I'll give you just a touch. <laughs> all right, let's have a go. Let's uh, walk down the, the aisle here. Oh, I need to just a little bit of, um, of broccoli, you see, to go in here as well. Doesn't that look nice? Remember, fill the plate up with things that you absolutely love when you're cutting down on the meat side. Looks good. All right, this is what I did here. I actually did the casserole dish so that I have a large piece of meat and I can get into it the knife and fork, two ounce piece. Here was the pre prime rib, about eight ounces. I've got a three and a half ounce piece here of the flank, and that looks really super. Here I had the tenderloin, a seven, eight ounce tenderloin, and here I've got a two ounce tenderloin sat up uh, to give you some visual height on it. So, how's that? Don't forget, you know, one of the really important things of this one is to measure the meat and think of the vegetables. When you cut down on meat, you could just spend all you like on vegetables and still save an awful lot of money. All right, here are the two dishes. Let's compare these two together for numbers. Let's go. All right, now here, there's the one that we've done. There is the prime rib. Now, I, I must say <coughs> that... Um, a prime rib would normally be, well, let's face it, 10 ounces or 12 ounces, something like that. <coughs> and that is a lot of meat, and much more than these numbers. But I've taken the conservative 8 ounce. So that's 709. This is what we do with it. We cut it over half, 305. Fat was 34, down to 8 total. Saturated fat was 13, down to 3. Percentage of calories from fat then is not 43, but 22%. Love it. Oh boy, I love this when it goes like this. Cholesterol, 181 down to 58. And sodium, 171 down to 80. Listen to all those down statements here. Dietary fiber, 5, and it's gone up to 6. I'll tell you, you know, if you are somebody who likes meat, and you said a husband likes meat and family likes meat, there's no real reason why not 
to actually get down to it with a piece of London broil like this. It is very tender. It's got great flavor. And, you know, if you don't like the wine, then, as I said, use the beef stock. But give yourself a little bit of a glaze. Mm. Tender. And the flavor of the wine is in there, too. Mm. If you like meat, you can still enjoy it and cut right back on the portion side. That'll minimize the risk and boost the flavor to the ceiling, all right? And save you a lot of money at the same time. Until then, God bless you. Look forward to the next program. Bye.